I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Roy Ashwa Agarwal, partner, is a, leader, is a leader in Everest Group's global sourcing practice. In his role, Roy Ashwa is focused on engagements and initiatives with global companies that focus on GBS shared services centers. He works extensively with global organizations and GBS clients on, on their talent strategy, including global workforce planning, innovative talent acquisition and management practices, remote delivery models, and more. Rajiv Barvaj is the Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Sun Life Asia Services Centers in India and Philippines. He's responsible for steering, uh, for steering the talent strategy, learning and development, employee services, engagement, and cultural transformation across the Sun Life Asia Services Center, ASC. Shivanji Kumar is a senior analyst in Everest Group's talent excellence practice. In this role, she assists clients on topics related to workforce trends and talent acquisition, development and retention strategy. David Palmieri is a managing director and head of global business services at Experian. As a transformation and innovation expert, David partners with business executives to deliver lasting, positive change that improves customer experience, employee engagement, and bottom line results. He's passionate about the future of work. Bruce Dance is the president of Bangalore-based Target, an extension of the US retailer Target's headquarters operation, operations. In this role, in this role, in this role, Bruce leads a team of more than 4,000 in fields ranging from technology, e-commerce, and marketing to human resources, finance, data science, and more. And with that, I will turn things over to Roy Ashwa. Hey, thanks, Thalapan. Uh, welcome to everybody who's dialing in today. And uh, welcome and thanks to my fellow panelists for joining us today. Uh, the topic we are covering today is very close to my heart. I've been covering uh, workforce strategy and talent uh, projects for a very long time. And uh, talent is at the core of everything that a GBS model stands for and delivers. And getting that right is the single most important thing to success. Uh, on the next slide, I'll break down the flow of the discussion today. So we have about 56 minutes of planned time. We'll use the next uh, 45 minutes approximately for that for three things. First, we'll start by talking more about what exactly are we going to talk about today? What is this top empl GBS employers analysis that we have done? This is a second year uh, for this type of analysis. We'll talk about why we did it, what we did, and how we did. And then once we have shared all of that, we will dive into the actual findings we have analyzed 300 plus GBS organizations from three of the biggest markets globally, India, Philippines, Poland. So we are very happy to be announcing the 2023 results today. And then most importantly for our audience today, we will not just announce the results, but we will go behind that and we'll unpack what does it take for organizations to become distinguished employers in the highly competitive GBS market? What is it that some of the companies have done differently and that is where I'm so happy that we have some of our uh, practitioners join us today uh, from Sun Life ASC, Target, and Experian to share directly from their experience and best practices. And then we'll keep some time at the end for Q&A. So I would encourage everybody to use the Q&A window uh, to submit their questions as we go along. Now, before we get started, let's do a quick poll question. While I know a lot of different aspects of employee value proposition are important to GBS uh, organizations. Which of these do you think is often overlooked? Let's see, uh, which one do you feel is the least uh, valued aspect of an employee value proposition? Seeing the responses pouring in, we'll give it another two seconds. Right, a few more seconds, then we'll
All right. So th thanks for responding. We had about three fourths of our agendas uh, share their inputs today. So compensation and benefits not ignored at all, but career development progression followed by leadership, the two most uh, undervalued or overlooked aspects. Shivangi, what do you make of that? This is very interesting to see, Rohit Ashwa, and I'm not surprised to see that career development and progression uh, followed by apologies. Uh, uh, it's I'm not surprised to see that uh, career develop uh, compensation and benefits followed by uh, flexibility and work life balance have a uh, high emphasis closely followed by uh, culture and values. What I'm slightly surprised by is why career development and progression, as well as leadership impact has low ratings, as we will see in the document that this is fairly emphasized on by employees. While some of these things resonate with how the employees are thinking, there's a takeaway that there's a gap on how employees are giving it more weightage than probably what employers who make up of our audience today feel should get. Right. Why don't you take us through what we have done in this analysis and then we'll unveil the results. Sure. Now, before we actually get to the results, we would like to spend some time on the approach and methodology that was adopted. This was a fairly unique form of analysis, which resonated with our clients very well last year. Hence, we are here with our sec second edition. Let us talk through what, why did we do it? What did we do? And how did we do it? Now, why did we do it and why are we looking into it? This is one of the most important questions that we usually get. Firstly, because companies have their own point of view and lack an outside in view. Second, even when companies look at the outside in view, there is nothing which is specific to GBS organizations. Even if there is, it is very generic, which might or might not work for you. Lastly, employee expectations are constantly changing in the competitive environment. Next, we look at what did we do? For this analysis, can we move, move to the next slide, please? Yes, next we look at what did we do? For this analysis, we looked at various data sources to create a point of view on what are the various dimensions of the employee value proposition. And we created a mechanism to get onto a feedback for each of these dimensions. Before we get started on that, it is important to note that we have not benchmarked any dimension and this is all perception based. Now, the five key dimensions are one, the overall satisfaction level with a particular company would employees recommend that GBS to their peers? Second, the overall compensation and benefit ratings that are impacted by flexible benefits and ratio of benefits and cash in hand of the salary component. We then come to work environment, which is one of the trickiest aspects as it is a combination of elements that keep changing over time. Broadly, there are five key elements impacted into it, which are work-life balance, office ecosystem, leadership, culture and values, and hybrid working opportunities. They make an important part of the overall work environment. We then have career opportunities, which are focused on learning and development, career and career and advancement opportunities, which are offered by an organization. And lastly, we have diversity and inclusion. So Shivangi, this is fairly interesting. You're saying you have not benchmarked these 300 companies on each of these parameters by taking data from them, but you have gone out and collected, you know, several hundred thousand data points on the public forum and seen what is the perception of these companies on each of these parameters. So important to emphasize, you know, on that once again is that this is the perception of these companies and which may, may not align with the real uh, position as well. Uh, but, but as perception is important, I see the point why you would do that. 
Uh, tell us how how did you do it, Shivangi? What what were your sources? How did you get the data? Uh, we went through a number of employee forums, job posting websites, social media, professional media, gathering thousands of data points. Some of the representative data sources are linked below. If we could move, just move to the next slide. But we picked and analyzed all of that. We put all that together in a sophisticated uh, model that we built and used it to generate the brand perception ratings of all the parameters that were mentioned on the previous slide. Right. On the next on the next slide, Rohit, why don't you tell us how should our audience today read the results and how did this all come together? Yeah, thank you, Angi. So as you said, you know, once we had uh, the brand perception rating across each of these parameters, we have put all of that together on a two by two so for, for ease of comparison within different organizations. So on the X axis, once you get to the results, you will see we have stacked together various parameters of brand perception and the ratings have been kind of weighted averages have been stacked up to say overall brand perception, how strong that is, farther along the right you are, the stronger the brand perception. And then on the Y axis, if somebody who does not have access to the privilege information your employers have, as an employee, when you are looking outside in and saying, how good is this company doing? What opinions do you form? Kind of that is reflected on the y-axis and together the companies that are in the top right are more likely uh, to be viewed as a favorable employer by uh, employees. Now in India alone, we track 1500 GBS organizations globally about 7,000. Why did we do this analysis only for 300? Well, it has to start somewhere. But also, uh, we went with the companies which are uh, which have the most revenue, which are the largest companies in their respective industries. We looked at their GBS model, which have the most scaled GBS model. We also looked at which are the most popular employers in these respective markets, India, Philippines, and Poland. But also, we were restricted by the data availability. To do this properly, we need, company, we need data on companies available in these public forums that Shivangi spoke about. So we actually started with a long list, longer list, but then because of lack of data availability, we did not feel it was appropriate to rank uh, some of the companies and hence the final list of 300, which is presented here. Now, without further delay, if we could have drum roll, please, let's move on to the results. So as we look at the next slide, here are the results for India. Uh, apologies, we know this is a fairly busy slide, but each of the 165 dots on this slide represents a unique organization. Their GBS, Global Business Services entity in India and the overall uh, rating of this outside in assessment. Now we are doing this assessment separately for top employers for tech talent. Now some of these GBS also have tech talent, but dedicated technology centers will also be assessed separately for likes to likes comparison, a report that will follow in a few weeks. Uh, but congratulations to the companies that are listed here today. We are celebrating their achievements. They have done really well to build and maintain their brand. And my congratulations to our three panelists today, uh, Rajiv from Sun Life, Bruce from Target, and David from Experian. All three of your organizations have uh, clearly you know, done something right uh, to, to have such strong brand perception in the industry. David, let me start with you. Uh, when, when you look at this analysis, you know, when you saw it for the first time, when you look at it today, how, how, how do you react to this? You know, where, where do you see this uh, relevant or, or, or kind of, you know, benefiting or sure. what does it say? Yeah, thanks, Rohit. Um, first, I'll say, you know, it's, it's a real honor to be here with, uh, with Ranjit and, and Bruce. Um, and when I, when I look at the list of names that are up here alongside Experian, the first thing I think of is, you know, these are some of the best brands in the world and many of whom are Experian's customers. Um, so it's uh, phenomenal to be recognized is sort of uh, the first feeling that I get. I think it validates our GBS strategy in a lot of ways. Um, at the same time, I'll say um, it's a journey and we know that we have to work really, really hard to maintain a competitive position. Um, and I would say, you know, we're a relatively new entrant 
but um, you know, the expectation is uh, about growth and you know, staying on the journey to attract the best talent in the world. So um, India is really central to that. So th this is a, a great milestone for us, but uh, you know, there's much work, more work to do. Thanks, David, and absolutely doesn't stop here, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, Bruce, if I might ask you the same question, uh, Target has been operating for a very long time in India. When you look at something like this, what are your reactions? Thanks, Rohit, and and David said it really well. I'm I'm, I'm excited to be on a a panel with um with with both David and Rajiv, but but honestly, when you like David said it exactly right, when you look at this list, these are are literally some of the best brands in the world, and you know while we definitely are honored to to be on this, you know I I think we're constantly asking ourselves you know, what is next? You know, we, we started in 2005 and, and we were very much a back office type of experience back then. And, and today, you know, we're constantly asking ourselves, what is next that the team and the talent in India can provide for, you know, for Target, um, you know, going forward? And so, you know, it, it is certainly a journey and it's good to be benchmarked. It's good to feel that the hard work that you're putting in is being recognized. Um, but but you gotta you gotta put that on the back burner real quickly and start looking forward around what is next, especially in in both the competitive environment but a landscape, you know that is that is changing um, with the global economy, kind of in the state that it's in. Absolutely, Bruce, and uh, we would love to talk more about how you maintain that consistent focus at Target, given that you were in the top employers list last year as well. Uh, but before we get to that. Uh, Rajiv, uh, and again, Rajiv, double congratulations to you, not just here on India, but if we move on to the Philippines uh, uh, results, congratulations to all the companies listed here. And Rajiv, Sun Life Financial, uh, your ASC centers, even in Philippines, are among the top employers, uh, second year in a running. So how do you react to that? Uh, Rohit, it is very humbling, and it's a privilege and an honor to be on this panel and this webinar with uh, David and Bruce and yourself. Uh, I think uh, the results are an outcome of a ceaseless, uh, you know, focus on excellence, which we at ASC have been following. Uh, something Bruce said uh, resonated very powerfully. Uh, I think today the GBS sector is asking itself, uh, what is the next frontier? What more can we do than just being a back office? And I think in many ways, uh, the redefinition of the scope and the landscape of performance in the GBS sector is leading to some innovation and transformational work, uh, you know, which is uh, the outcome of which uh, is what we see here. Uh, it's a validation uh, on many fronts. It's a validation of our EVP our purpose and our values, uh, which we as an organization believe in. Uh, but what truly is heartening is that it's a very competitive landscape and uh, you're fitted amongst the best of the best. So it feels very humbling. Great. And, and uh, the important point you raised is that as the expectations from the GBS are changing, your talent model is changing. But as you target a different kind of talent, the expectations of that talent from the GBS organization are also changing. So your EVP needs to keep up and continuously evolve. Uh, uh, Rajiv will request you to shed some uh, light on that as we uh, hear more about your story. Let me also share the results for Poland uh, very quickly uh, before we get into the discussion part. And uh, congratulations to all the companies that have uh, uh, you know, featured uh, here among top employers in Poland. Uh, we, uh, I was actually in conversation with uh, some of these, you know, the the uh, Takeda uh, and then the AstraZeneca, Cisco, a few weeks back. Uh, we did a LinkedIn Live, and uh, it was very insightful how what it seems like they are enjoying benefits of a strong brand perception. It is relentless effort day in and day out. In fact, a little bit of you know uh, struggle because being good employers, their talent is good. There's a target, no pun intended, you know, painted on your back. Uh, so you have to continuously keep up with this. Uh, with that, let, let me let me uh, move on, and then we'll just unpack with what makes these companies, you know, really stand out. Uh, 
uh, over here, I would like to congratulate all the top employers that have been recognized in our analysis this year. We would like to congratulate them and would like them to reach uh, as and we will be reaching out to some of these companies to congratulate them one on one. We would encourage all of you, if you see your company's name up here in the list, do write to us because we are rolling out digital batches to recognize this achievement. And you can use these batches in your email IDs, in your LinkedIn profiles and various other places. On the next slide, I would also like to take this opportunity to make an offer to all our listeners today. You have seen the two by two plots and the recognized top employers. We will be reaching out to some of you for, with your digital batches, along with a benchmark of your detailed brand perception analysis. For the rest of the top employers, we have looked at 300 plus GBS centers across geog geographies. So you are there somewhere on the plot do fill out the link given in the comment section to request a detailed complimentary benchmark for your company. Please note that these uh, benchmarks would only be available and can be seen by your company itself and no other firm. If you so were- that's an, important, that's an important call out, Shivangi. Thanks for that. Uh, we are only celebrating the top employer's position, but any company specific feedback will only be shared with respective companies and not not kind of publicly uh, because the intent here is to help help each of you do better uh, so thanks for that shivangi uh, let's let's move on and unpack this uh, further right so what what impacts the gbs brand perception and let's look at some of our analysis what did it show uh, to start with uh, something that uh, all three of our panelists said uh, you know uh, it is not given. You have to continuously work on it. And interestingly, the analysis shows that as compared to last year, 37% companies saw a decline in their brand perception in India. In Philippines, even more concerning, 85% of the companies saw a decline in their brand perception year on year. Now, we were also arguing, was this a bad year for the employers? What did they do wrong? And in reality, there was a significant overemphasis on employee engagement during COVID and then during the talent war. And then as things eased out in late 2022, early 2023, probably uh, companies started to settle a little, but employees are missing that uh, uh, treatment or a little bit of that benefits. So we saw a lot of that feedback at an industry level uh, deteriorate the brand perception. But as you will see, even in Poland, a fair bit of companies uh, suffered a decline in their brand perception. So yes, it is not one in given. You can be, uh, you know, uh, really the situation can be upsetting. Let me ask you uh, this, David. Experian rode against the tide. Industry level, the feedback was deteriorating, but Experian jumped many places to make significant improvement in your brand perception. I'm sure it is not a, it's, it's, it's just not happened like that. What did you do over the last few years that has now materialized to, to this outcome? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really a combination of, of a few things. And what struck me with the survey at the beginning of the webinar was exactly those things that are overlooked are exactly those things that we've focused on. So things like career path and DEI initiatives, hugely important. Uh, leadership impact. Um, I can honestly say we have some of the best engineering leadership in, in Hyderabad, which is our, uh, the base of our global innovation center and flexibility. So when, when you see an announcement from any um, you know, well-known brand, I won't name any, saying that they're forcing people back into the office, that usually translates to an opportunity for Experian to attract some really, really great talent. So we practice what we call everyday flexibility where teams are designing their ways of working and uh, they decide whether or not they come into the office with what frequency or if they come into the office at all. So those things, the combination of those things, I think is a real needle mover for us um, in this year. But no, we know, as I said earlier, that there's so much more that we need to do. But just in the past year or two, those, those have made a huge difference. David, if I might ask you, uh, a lot of our clients ask this, that while 
everyday flexibility sounds great. How do you manage it practically on a day-to-day -day basis with your mid-level managers thinking about tactically where their team is operating from that day? How are they managing some of these ad hoc requests? So what kind sure. of challenges do you face to enable that kind of model and how do you work around them? I think the, the foundation to this is trust that teams are um, inspired to do the right thing and, and will actually deliver what they're committing to. Um, alongside of that, we have enabling tools. I think our culture um, respects a high degree of flexibility. And the fact that we work across time zones so well um, plays well to different modes and different means of working within the team. So teams may decide to start their day at different points um, and they may go to a compressed work week. They have a lot of flexibility to deliver what they need to do, take into account you know, um, other, I'll say more personal obligations, whether it's family members or schooling or what have you. So there's a high degree of trust. Um, enabling tools are a big part of that. But um, it's, it's something that we don't try to control as much as create an environment where people can do the work that they've committed to um, without you know, um, looking over each other's shoulder. It's just not necessary. We see great results and we trust that teams figure out the best way to get it done. So that, that's very interesting. And also creating that environment, especially the trust aspect, it also takes time. Now you said you don't try to control it. Does it also mean if some teams are not very comfortable with it, then they get to take their own time to arrive at the same level of flexibility where there may be less flexibility. If, if some teams are very new, there has been a lot of changes in talent or mm -hmm. team composition, then till the time they figure things out. So is, is, it, is it assumed that every team will operate at the same level of day-to-day -day flexibility or are there variations which teams will yeah. decide? Variations are are completely expected, and uh, the composition of the team teams change over time. Teams will consolidate. They'll also introduce new teams to focus on different products or features, functionality that we're trying to introduce into the market. So one of the things that we've done is introduce uh, what we call global global agile coaches that work with the teams to advance their ways of working to come up to speed, not play to the lowest common denominator but actually try to elevate people to the highest overall position. So we're continuously improving and delivering better and faster. So the coaching aspect, not just training, but active coaching is, uh, has really been a game changer for us. So ways of working alongside of the product teams has, has been a really big deal. And thanks for sharing that, David. That's really insightful. Rajiv, let me ask you this uh, again. Philippines, particularly 85% companies seeing a decline in their brand perception. Uh, Sun Life has managed to hold on to the top employer's position. And again, the way I said it, I realize I don't do justice to the hard work. You know, you have kind of maintained that lead position in the industry. And then in India as well, which numbers may not show, but is still fairly competitive. What do, what do you do differently and how do you maintain that uh, momentum in, in your efforts? Uh, you know, I think in Philippines, we do have an unfair advantage. Uh, we are a 126 year old company and uh, the number one uh, insurance company in Philippines. So that, that definitely is something which is very, very helpful uh, in differentiating ourselves in the market. Uh, but I think given the competitive landscape and given the volatility, which the market dynamics is seen. Uh, I think what we've done is we've kind of focused on a set of core principles uh, which have stood us uh, well. Uh, the first and foremost, right from the very beginning, uh, employee well-being has been prioritized. Uh, whether it is the physical wellness, mental wellness, financial wellness, we've kind of really kind of given it the kind of importance uh, which post COVID, a lot of companies are now beginning to focus on. So that's something which has been uh, very, very key to our employee value proposition. We are a very caring employer. Uh, secondly, given our nature of work uh, in the GBS, we have been very, very focused on uh, building and sustaining effective learning strategies. Uh, 
we kind of ensure that all employees have different learning opportunities based their needs, whether it is on the technology, domain, behavioral uh, side, and make appropriate investments. One of the things where we have really focused recently, uh, given the uh, challenges of uh, post-COVID hybrid work, is managerial capability and leadership effectiveness. So that that's something which is kind of is going to pay us dividends as we realize that that's a gap which needed to be filled. Uh, we also are extremely focused on career paths. The fact remains that when you hire the Gen Zs, uh, they are looking at growth. And if there is a defined growth path, which is clearly uh, you know visible and achievable, uh, it increases stickiness. So that's whether it is on the technology side or on the business operation side, we've kind of uh, brought the career progression piece to life. And along with that, we've also invested in an engineering career framework where we've also ensured that the technical depth for people who may not be interested in uh, people management gets uh, equally addressed and equally rewarded. Uh, I would also believe that listening is something which many organizations uh, do not pay as much attention as they need to. Uh, we have quarterly surveys uh, which are conducted. Employee Pulse is very closely monitored. Uh, we have multiplicity of forums, uh, skip level, round tables. Uh, we have fun uh, town halls, et cetera, which kind of ensures that the employee voice uh, is listened to and taken care of. Uh, we have a chatbot, uh, which uh, is across India and Philippines, reaches out randomly to employees and understands uh, their concerns. Are they feeling good on a particular day, uh, on an anniversary timeline? Uh, and, you know, what is it that we could do? And that has really helped us identify some of the quieter lot who may not be vocal, but may not be feeling up to it. So reaching out and understanding what are some of the factors which Im impact and influence human behavior. And lastly, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, the DEI part, I think we have constantly changed the definition by building up on it. So we have not rested on the laurels there. And uh, there is some amazing work happening. And yet we feel that we've still not you know, done as much as we can. And therefore, that's again something which uh, is both employee-led and organization-supported as we look at building up a very robust culture and a very caring and employee-centric philosophy in all of which we do, what we do. Uh, that, that, that's really interesting, uh, Rajiv. And again, uh, it is a multi-pronged approach, all the different things that you are trying. Let me ask you one question, particularly on the care aspect that you highlighted. And again, insurance company, some would argue, you know, the aspect of care and investing in wellness comes naturally, and it's also a lot of business you know, uh, benefit if, if people are kind of healthier, happier, kind of helps helps the business as well. But tell me this, uh, how much of it was part of your DNA and activities before COVID versus during COVID and during talent scramble? And the reason I ask is a lot of companies ask us, we have significantly ramped up our focus on care. We are still not seeing the impact. and the observation we have is you need to do it sustainably to convince your employees you really care and not just say this year I'm doing this so I care. How, how, and any, anything you want to share with your peers today on you may invest as much as somebody else this year in care initiatives, but how do you really sustain that and then win the trust of your employees? Uh, that, that's a really interesting question. I, I'd like to actually take you back to COVID days where there was no defined manual of what is the right thing to do because every day threw up a new situation and a new opportunity to kind of uh, make a contribution or do something different. And I think at that point in time, the, the care which was embedded in the DNA of the organization came to the fore. Uh, I think employee care is how you would treat each unique situation within the framework of, I would say, policies and standards, and yet having the ability to take a call, which could be different. And uh, I think what has really stood out for us 
is our ability to listen to our employees and handle each individual case uniquely and see how we can kind of do what works best for the individual and what works best for the organization. So from that perspective, uh, it could mean someone wanting uh, extra leave because of health reasons. And uh, you kind of, kind of look at that and say, can I do something a little more than what would normally be done by organizations? Uh, it could be someone going for uh, a higher education and, and you know, the organization offering to kind of help beyond what could be the, the limits which we at times set for ourselves and say, you know, we'll do up to this amount or this much aspect. I think the ability to demonstrate flexibility in an ongoing manner, uh, in a sensitive, respectful way, uh, also ensures over a period of time, people know what to expect and how can they, you know, uh, fall back on the organization with the trust that they would be held. I know that that's very well said, uh, Rajiv. Uh, thanks for emphasizing on that. Uh, as we move on, uh, what uh, we kind of looked at data from many different angles, right? Uh, uh, a lot of our analysts love doing that, just diving deep into the data, looking at it from each, slicing and dicing it from each different angle and seeing what makes sense, what doesn't. One of the things is some industries tend to do better than others. Uh, retail CPG in particular, uh, where we have uh, Bruce kind of, you know, representing the entire industry today, uh, have a very high share. So about 20% of the top employers this year in India come from this particular industry. Uh, Bruce, can I just assume that being part of this industry gives you a natural uh, advantage and makes it an easy playing field for you? I'm not sure. I'd, I'm not sure I'd assume that. I mean, if you think about the industry, it's a fun industry. I mean, the reality that the reality of it is, you know, we're, we're kind of all consumers, and we all have opinions about being, you know, a consumer, whether you're in, you know, the U.S., India, or Philippines. So it, it's something that naturally people can, you know, understand and and and, and respect. Um, and you know, we we talk a lot about this, but. We call our customers guests. The guest votes every day. And so every day they can choose where they want to shop, you know, with their wallet. So you, you get real time, you know, experiences across the platform. So, so retail is a, it's a really fun industry. You know, I think as far as, you know, Target and, and how we have shown up, um, you know, in this experience the last couple of years, you know, you, you heard a lot of the, the same things that David and Rajiv talked about, you know, are really, really important to us. But maybe, you know, two things I would I would build upon, you know, for us, you know, we have incredible alignment with our leadership team, you know, across all aspects of, of uh, our second headquarters in Bangalore. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've got our C-suite traveling to India you know, multiple times a year, and, and, and they know our team well, like they know multiple levels of leadership there is a really closeness to it. And, and I think what that establishes is it's one team. It's not Target in the US and, and Target in India, but it's Target. And, and that builds a lot of trust because, you know, a, a director working on, uh, on a platform in India, you know, they have a direct line into VPs, SVPs, and frankly, sometimes a C-suite on projects. And, and they're very much a part of that, right? And so, You've got that alignment. You've got that um, continuity, you know, across the board. And you know what that has given us is it's given our leadership team in the U.S. incredible amounts of confidence in the team in India. And so the work that our team in India does is, is very meaningful. It is. It is. You know, again, it's not back office work. In fact. Even when we look at back office work, we're trying to actually automate that and challenge the way we do it. So our team members actually can continue to work on strategic level ideas and, and projects. So if you take a lot of the, the, the great things that, that was already discussed around culture, DEI, flexibility, you layer then a commitment from the leadership team, and you layer in the ability for team members in India to work on really incredible guest facing work. I think that's how you get the type of environment that allows us to show up in these surveys in ways that we're really proud of. And Bruce, uh, 
that that's very helpful you know and then definitely very powerful for your existing workforce but when it comes to your brand among people who you are targeting as you grow as you hire new skills uh, i can see on this slide for example you know ikea and amazon and mondelez fairly popular regular household names in their own you know areas and their own products but then we see lowes we see uh, you know target kimberly clark big global brands but if i look at the india market these yeah. are not well known household names you know if if young talent wants to apply they they have to tell their parents what this company does how big this is this is a relevant employer how, how how do you deal with that how do you make sure your brand and your evp gets across to those who have not been part of your organization yeah that's a great question and you know years ago you know we had a saying um uh, around the organization that we're one of the best kept secrets in india um and i remember just that's that's the exact strategy that's the exact opposite of the strategy we need to have we we need to be known and we need to invest in and and so you know for for us we have a we have a robust investment in our employment brand within india and our overall communications team so we have a robust communications team we have a robust marketing budget and we're out there talking about the things that are important to us and so we show up whether it's in different industry conferences we show up um at multitudes of different universities depending on what we're trying to accomplish there and then we also host our own experiences whether it's on the um the emergence of ai and how we use ai to scale we spend a lot of time on diversity in tech and how important that is you know for our overall um belief and target of, of a larger dni strategy so we invest in it we invest a lot in it we have a very robust uh strategy we have kpis that we look at and we measure you know throughout the year and so it's 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 top of mind it literally is on my uh goals and objectives every year is how we show up in the industry thanks bruce so on the next slide right uh we have uh, and again we did a lot of sentiment analysis uh, like like shivangi earlier mentioned you know, thousands and thousands of data points feedback points and kind of we brought all of that together to say what are employees appreciating the most when we look at the top employers what jumps out what makes them stand out or which of those multiple things that you can do makes you stand out the most and while i say that what is what stands out the most i still see a, a long list of things you know listed here a long list of uh, initiatives or characteristics so right from a career pathing is fairly there market competitive salary work life balance uh, helpful coworkers a lot of that uh, so david uh, a lot of this has been spoken about but let me ask you this uh, you know when you have to pick what do you go after because of course you can't be best in class in everything however much you want to be how do you pick that what should you invest mm -hmm. in the most and uh, a second question i'll relate which is coming in from our audience is that uh, how much of that flexible work policy directly impacted your ability to hire and retain talent did you see that impact your brand real time uh, but but starting with when you have to pick your strategy how do you decide what to go after not that every, anything is less important yeah I, when i look at this list you know i'm reminded that there's no silver bullet here at all and there's not just one important thing to go after um i think you know the thing that's maybe not emphasized as much on this page is the type of work that's being done and the type of work we do in our global innovation center in hyderabad is um you know some of the most innovative work that we're doing anywhere in the company right it's client facing it's new features and functionality it's it's the platforms that we deliver for our customers and so the type of work is is hugely impactful now underpinning that is a huge focus on ai machine learning things that are more cutting edge in nature and i think that helps us attract some of the best talent but the things i think keep people and keep them really engaged um and and again i i'm looking at bruce here he said it really really well it's that leadership engagement that connectedness to our purpose as a company flexibility upscaling career path work 
all of those things are hugely important to retaining people. But I think it's a type of work that we do that gets people really excited about joining Experian and, and being part of that journey that we're on. Well said, David. And if we flip this and we look at the next page, we will see what is the negative feedback. And a lot of this is the reverse of what you saw on the previous page, but a lot of uh, focus on pay correction, but the culture aspect, right? Whether it is work-life balance, bureaucracy, politics, micromanagement. Uh, somebody said a, a lot of comments, in fact, highly corporate organization. So uh, the, the young talent, you know, there's a multi-generational workforce. They want to operate differently. So uh, uh, let, me, let me ask this to you, Bruce. Now, there are two, three ways to look at it, right? One, yes, we get the feedback. We need to change the way we operate. Second, probably there is a communication gap. We, this is not true, but is a perception. And then third, there is a lot of noise in the system. We are doing our best, can't do anything different. When you look at the negative elements or the feedback areas, how do you approach that? How do you think about what can target do differently or your advice on what can your peers do differently? Well, you know, just like Rajiv said, we, we've got a, a number of different ways that we listen to our team and, and, and get surveys for. And so, you know, for, for us, it's, it's all about prioritization. Like you, you, you cannot tackle everything on this list. And, and frankly, you know, you, you will do a terrible job if you're trying to do everything, right? So what are the most important elements that your team is sharing with you combined with your overall culture strategy and what you're trying, you know, to do? And so, you know, no doubt um, flexibility is a, a, a really interesting one, you know, that we are tackling right now. I, I think we have an incredible flexible, you know, um, environment, but I, you could also start hearing the rumblings of, boy, when, when we are together, when we are at the office together, boy, it sure feels like it's a better energy or we're getting more things done, right? So we're, you know, we're all interesting entering, entering a new time period where flexibility has got to be there. It's like, I, I just don't see it going away. And yet at the same time, the moments that matter where you come together as a team um, are really important. So how do you create what the new work week looks like or the new work month looks like or the new experiences together? That That's top of my mind because I think it's evolving. Gen Z has different expectations than, than uh, you know, somebody like myself in, in the Gen X world. And, and yet we're all trying to deliver the same thing. So, you know, for us, how do you find one or two things that are really important? Put all of your energy in, in, into that so you actually move the needle versus trying to tackle all of this. So that's a good advice, Bruce. And uh, as we move on to the next slide, right? Another complication that comes with organizations that operate across geographies is that uh, there is a cultural difference. The expectations are different. So while some things may be true to your organization, some things need to be adjusted to the local employee uh, expectations and might also be reflective of the kind of work you do there, how mature you are there, what kind of legacy you have, good or bad. And, and Rajiv, you spoke about having benefits of being a 125 plus year old organization. There are also certain disadvantages where sometimes when a business goes through a certain change, divestiture, exit, anything, you know, uh, uh, different, it also impacts the brand of the GBS organization. It's, it's, it's important to highlight GBS as a different organization, but it's also linked to the brand. It enjoys the benefits, but also the limitations of it. Now you operate in both India and Philippines. And what we saw in Philippines, generally last year, we saw the feedback is more positive, but then we also saw the discontent to be more, you know, people being more quick to show discontent. So between last year and this year, a little bit of fluctuation was also there. And then Poland, where uh, there is more direct feedback, both positive and negative. Whereas in India, we also see a trend where there is a higher propensity to voice over dissatisfaction versus satisfaction. So some interesting things that pop out once we look at a lot of data points. Uh, Rajiv, how do you adjust your approach, you know, 
to, to kind of make sure that you are maintaining that one sun life culture while adjusting for your local team's expectations across the centers? So, so I think one thing which is important for us is that uh, culture is both a defining and a differentiating factor uh, for sun life, both uh, in India, in Philippines, and all the other markets we operate in. Uh, having said that, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, when you enjoy the benefits of uh, a brand, you are also at the perils of uh, market vol volatility and movement. Uh, I would say that, uh, and that is where a bit of strategy customization comes in handy. Uh, in Philippines, uh, while the brand is recognized more for the insurance sector as a GBS player, we have also carved out a niche for ourselves in the GBS market. Philippines is known for its voice talent, and uh, we have leveraged that to create a very healthy uh, voice facility for the larger Sun Life organization across the world. Uh, also, Philippines gives us the advantage of operating in the same time zone uh, as rest of Asia. So that is something which uh, we have leveraged for our technology operations uh, to support the Asia uh, businesses, uh, which are uh, multi-country operations. Uh, in India, on the other hand, uh, you know, we uh, have focused on the non-voice business operations, the technology, which is a differentiating factor for organizations in India. And uh, uh, what we call as knowledge services, where, uh, you know, we've kind of focused on financial shared services, actuarial, legal, and HR shared services. We kind of kind of gone beyond and supported the global operations and uh, support, you know, supported them from here uh, has been something which has uh, really helped. Uh, while we uh, have kind of customized our strategy, the fact remains that it has also opened up opportunities for internal mobility and giving people an opportunity to do more than what they have done. Uh, people normally also tend to exit at times because of boredom or they've had too much of the same. So the ability to kind of rotate talent internally and uh, across functions, across lines of businesses, uh, backed by a very, uh, I would say, efficient uh, learning and development machinery uh, has helped uh, you know, keep employees motivated and hungry and looking for more. Uh, but, you know, again, cultural nuances remain very important, both from a perspective of how, uh, you know, how you land initiatives and how do you sustain them. So that, that's insightful. And it links back to the point David made when we were looking at the positive sentiment is that the nature of work is very important and adjusting the EVP, adjusting your positioning to the kind of the talent you are hiring for the kind of work you are doing it all kind of goes hand in hand uh, thanks for that rajiv uh, it's been a great discussion we are moving into the last 6 minutes and the time has passed by really quickly uh, just to remind everyone who's listening in today uh, shivangi has very uh, generously offered uh, all of you uh, to request for your uh, company's positioning on this analysis and then uh, get your customized results so uh, you'll see details on the next slide, but there'll be a link in the chat, which you can use to make that request or write to me or Shivangi. Uh, you can choose the location where you operate and uh, let us know which company you represent and we'll send you your uh, company benchmarks. Uh, now, uh, we'll take some questions. There are a lot of questions coming in from our audience, but before we do that, uh, just to quickly wrap it up on the next page, you know, if I were to look at some of our key takeaways, uh, I think to, to summarize, we are talking about brand development is a continuous effort. Uh, you can celebrate success, but you can't relax. You know, need to need to keep going, adapting, evolving. Uh, pump and bend, we saw in the poll earlier, nobody thinks it is overlooked. So it, it needs to, it, it stays front and center of the EVP, but all those other aspects become very important. But there's a focus on holistic benefits policy, uh, flexibility. Uh, David spoke about it, Bruce spoke about it, how it is very, very important to ensure and embrace flexibility. Uh, it's not about one thing is better than other. Uh, teams do operate better sometimes when they are together. 
But how do you offer flexibility in situations? Rajiv also talked about that. Sustained focus on culture and experience is critical. It is not just about what you do, but how you do it, how you sustain it, how you build the trust among different employees. And lastly, uh, Rajiv, you mentioned it, how you have regular employee feedback, surveys, pulse. Bruce, you also alluded to some of these surveys, but it is important to maintain an understanding of the pulse of the employee sentiment. Misalignment in internal uh, and external brand perception is, is really an unfortunate situation and something everybody should avoid. Uh, once again, I'll, I'll thank everybody. We have about three minutes, so probably we can squeeze in a couple of questions. At the same time, the questions we are not able to get to, we'll send you some, some of our responses after the webinar and feel free to contact us for more details. Let me start with you, uh, David. How can successful GBS organizations take some of the learnings and export them to the broader organization because the challenge of brand perception is not unique to GBS alone. How do you, how do you see a potential opportunity there for GBS leaders to help the broader organization? Yeah, I, one, of, one of the things that we've done uh, around that is talk about um, how the different things that we've done in, in our GBS organization have benefited us. So we're not actively selling to the rest of the organization, but simply educating people about what we've done, the problems we've solved. And it's, uh, it's really the exception where people don't wanna learn more or at least experiment with the things that we've done in GBS. So a few examples were, you know, what we've done around Lean Six Sigma, um, where initially people kind of viewed it as a training program. They saw the value for, we we're streamlining and automating and introducing robotics and the business loved it. Um, and on that basis, we were able to export it. Another one has to do with our uh, flexibility program, which we call FlexWork, but it's now a big part of our future of work strategy. We rolled that out pre-pandemic, um, really as a means to attract and retain people. The pandemic hit and now FlexWork has you know, become deeply embedded into our culture. So a lot of those things where we're learning and experimenting are now developed within GBS, right, within our centers. And we simply educate the rest of the company about what we've done and the problems that we've solved. And it's just taken off, I'll say more organically um, on that basis. Got it. So thanks, David. A uh, couple of questions, I'll just clarify that we are mainly looking at GBS organizations, which are managed by organizations management, uh, you know, sitting in uh, source markets or the GBS location. So the managed services outsourced model is not really uh, at play here. Uh, managed captives uh, are, are, are kind of not dominating this analysis list. Bruce, last minute, let me combine a couple of questions. How much of culture is unique to GBS versus an extension of the organization's culture? And second, you are hiring multi-generational workforce now. How do you tweak the EVP to match the Gen Zs and uh, all the other you know, uh, generations of workforce you have? Yeah, well, let me uh, let me start with the first one. Um, you know, we have, we have one culture across Target, uh, uh, no no doubt. It's really important that that is established that we 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 invest in it and we do the right things to make that culture seamless. Whether you're in Minneapolis, whether you're in any uh, uh, India, or our stores, two thousand stores across the the, the um, country. However, when you walk into our Bangalore headquarters. You will certainly feel the strength of India showing up, and so you'll hear the same languages that we use um, at our global headquarters. But yet, at the same time, the things that make India such a special place for talent, um, you know, show up, and that's what I think all of our leaders who visit, you know, our team in India get incredibly excited about because they they see the same things that they talk about and invest in, but then they see, you know. Frankly, you know, superpowers that 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 give certain aspects of our business some things that are that we're really proud about. So I, I think that's you know really uh, an important thing is it's got to connect back, but at the same time let the strengths you know of the the, the global headquarters show up. As far as investing, I mean, listen, you, you got to get the right talent you know for the problems that you solve, and a more diverse workplace is going to yield better results. That that is a 
that is an established, you know, paradigm that's out there. And so, you know, when it comes to how we build a culture around diversity, how we build a culture around our talent acquisition team that's out there, how we build a culture around the onboarding that has takes place, it's got to be diverse in nature. So somebody coming from, from Gen X can have the same success that somebody coming from Gen Z, you know, when you join ours, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be a focus across the board. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. And thanks, everybody, for joining us.